Hi, my name is John Lawton, Certified Financial Planner with Open Air Advisors. Welcome to the quarter three quarterly market update. I'll be joined by Stuart Fields and Chris Massenberg, who will be along later on in the presentation. So just getting started, our table of contents for today is, uh, we'll start with the market summary uh, and macro backdrop. We'll be talking about asset markets and long-term themes. So getting started with market summary. In quarter three, the primary uh, driver has been stagflation. And a lot of us haven't seen this since the 70s, but uh, what is stagflation? Stagflation is, is a slowing growth uh, with inflation. So two, uh, we'll say uh, uh, headwinds to a market are a rising inflation, but also a, a slowing economy. And, and right now, a Federal Reserve that's also raising interest, price, interest rates uh, to tamp down or to slow down uh, those inflationary pressures. Uh, the U.S., we would say, is in late cycle expansion. So it, we seem to still be, and I know Stuart's going to be talking about this a little later in the, in the presentation, we, start in it, we still are in an expansionary time period, uh, but it really looks to be def defined as late cycle. Uh, we are seeing some, in China, we're starting to see some policy easing. So China uh, has had a zero COVID policy, which has kept them really still dealing with COVID. Um, they are uh, starting to, to open things up quite a bit, um, but they still haven't been where the rest of the, the world has been raising interest rates and starting to slow inflationary pressures. Uh, they're still in the uh, appeasing stage of the market cycle. Um, we would say that uh, inflation has probably passed its cyclical peak. Uh, so we do believe that the inflation has peaked and we should start to see it coming down. Um, the Fed's ramped up tightening cycle and global rate hikes are dampening liquidity and adding to growth risks. So in asset markets, um, asset markets are um, prices dropped through the quarter. As you know, we'll be talking about that a little bit later on as interest rates and in dollar moved uh, sharply upward. Uh, we are starting to see slower liquidity growth uh, with persistent inflationary risk um, and slowing growth momentum. Some of these challenging dynamics that have been priced in the market, we'll be talking about that a little later on. How far are we in the, you know, as, as the market has come down this year, how much of this is priced in? Um, but in looking at it, we have um, late cycle positioning implies smaller cyclical tilts. So the, the tilts to the portfolio will be smaller as long-term portfolio diversification does remain warranted. So widespread declines across asset categories. So just going through, this has been one of the years and, and we've talked about it, um, equities versus bonds. Uh, this is one of those years that's kind of the, the, the full recipe of, of challenges. Most of the time uh, when the market's going down, we put a portfolio in uh, a full diversified portfolio, should have stocks and bonds. Um, as those stocks come down, usually you see market appreciation in your fixed income in your bonds. Uh, this has been the year where it's hit both sides of the both sides of the portfolio. So, um, as you look, uh, if we looked at large cap U.S. stocks down about twenty four percent as this was written, and I believe this is the uh, the the date for this is uh, October thirtieth is the print for this uh, uh, the this data. Uh, U.S. corporate bonds, long term bonds are are down equally, or actually more than. Uh, U.S. large cap, uh, U.S. large cap stocks. So we're seeing on both sides of the balance sheet, um, and this is one of those time periods in a cyclical bear market where we see rising inflation, rising rates hitting both sides of of the balance sheet. Uh, you'll notice as well, gold down nine point two percent year to date. But as of quarter three, and I've I've talked to several of you, hey, what should we look at commodities or should we look at gold inside the portfolio? It, if we had done that uh, last quarter, that would have been one of our, our worst performers in the quarter. Uh, we haven't decided to do that, so that's not something that we have at, as an issue. But again, uh, widespread declines across asset categories. Since 2008, we've basically been in a zero rate policy. And so if you look at this chart, essentially what it's showing you is U.S. Eurozone, uh, United Kingdom, and Japan. Uh, starting at 2007, where you see rates were somewhere in that, that 5 to 6% range. Uh, through 2008 and 2009, they basically dropped to zero. 
uh, and we have been in essentially a zero rate policy uh, since 2009. Um, what you see there is uh, US in 2017, 2018, uh, if you recall, rates started to come back up again, but as soon as uh, we had COVID, we went right back down to a zero rate policy. All of this has led to an inflationary environment. And, and let me just say this, the reason that we did that, especially coming out of 2008, 2009, was to expand the economy. Uh, when businesses don't have a carrying cost of debt, when you can go refinance something, um, that spurs investment in the business and it will grow the economy. Um, the challenge to it is, is as you do that, uh, it, it will build and build and build until we start to see inflationary pressures. And so uh, the main tool of the FMOC, uh, the Federal Reserve, to, um, to bring down inflation is to raise interest rates. And so that's what you're seeing. Um, they're going near vertical at the moment. Uh, U.S. is, is definitely uh, one of those leading the charge. You're seeing the, the, the U.K. coming up as well uh, in the last quarter. But uh, raising interest rates, the goal of raising interest rates is to slow down the economy. And I think Jerome Powell in each one of his speeches has, has been very clear, it will take slowing down the economy to reduce inflation. And so that's the, that is their objective. The idea is that balancing act between a recession uh, and just being able to raise interest rates, obviously they, they don't necessarily want to put us into a, a recessionary environment. But the goal is to slow down the economy um, so that inflation does come down. Um, where that winds up or, or where we end up as far as interest rates goes, anyone, really anyone's guess, um, you know, what does it look like in, in December? We're, we're not sure. Um, uh, but I, I know that we'll be talking about that or, or our expectations for continuing rate increases later on in the presentation. So how much of the bad news is, is, is pr already priced in? And I think this is one that we get a lot of, where, where's the bottom? And I think a lot of us are searching for, you know, where's the bottom to this, this economy or this, this, this current market? Uh, currently, as a, again, as of the writing of this uh, presentation, market's down about 25%. Um, in a non-recessionary environment, we get negative 22%. We, we get years of, of minus 22% uh, drops without there being a recession. So that's, that's a fairly common uh, fairly common occurrence us us going you know the market being down uh, this much in a recessionary time uh on average bear markets from 1872 to 2022 uh is the average down is about minus 35 percent and so you know how much is priced in well we're already down 25 percent um, a lot of this is already priced in so even though i like to say uh, we're a lot closer to the bottom than we are at the top um, I, I think that anyone trying to guess or, or predict uh, where that absolute bottom is, I'm not sure. We might have already passed it. Um, there's, there's no way to know, but I do think that we are much closer to the bottom than we are at the top. Just to define this a little bit better, um, as far as bear markets are concerned, there's basically three types of bear markets. There's structural, cyclical, and event-driven. Structural are, tr are triggered by imbalances in financial bubbles. Um, cyclical is the one, the one there in the center that I want to talk about, because this one really is defined uh, well by, by what's going on in the market today. And it's typically a function of rising rates, an impending recession, and falling profits. Uh, the status is elevated inflation and rising rates through policy remains accommodative and private sector is still strong. So I, I think that's uh, the closest definition to what we have today. Um, so when we, we switch to the next slide, it'll give us a, a better idea of what the averages are. So the average decline in a cyclical bear market, you know, in the previous slide, we were talking about 35%. Well, if we're talking about a cyclical bear market, the average is only 30%. Again, that's closer to that bottom that we talked about. Average length is about 25 months for a cyclical bear. Now these are averages, some are longer, some are shorter. So we just need to recognize that this could go longer than two years and it could be shorter than two years. Um, I would say the start to this was January of this year. So if we're looking at two years, we'd be looking at you know, the end of 2023. There you go. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, again, with the, the cyclical, an average time to recover is about 50 months. So if you're looking at the time frame for this period, uh, that's really what we're looking at as far as averages go. But how much of this is already priced in? We've already gotten to a 25% down. Um, if the average is 30, we, we may have already hit the bottom. We'll see. 
to be determined. I don't have a crystal ball. Stock market and treasury bond correlations versus inflation. And so again, we talked about when we looked at all of the, the asset prices at the beginning and the charts there, um, you know, with higher inflation, the market is more correlated. So stocks and bonds are more correlated. And essentially what this is showing you is this year, this is one of those time periods in a high inflationary environment with rising interest rates. What you notice if we just look at the, the right-hand side, we have a positive correlation um, during a time period of, of higher inflation. So dynamic asset allocation over time. And so uh, we do make changes to our, our portfolios. We do make changes to our asset allocations during different times of the market. Um, when you look at the different types of time horizons, so uh, secular is 10 to 30 years, business cycle is one to 10 and tactical is, is one to 12 months. Um, as we make changes in the business cycle and, and really what we're gonna talk about is, is business cycle and tactical allocations. Um, business cycle is the asset allocation for um, you know, that's, that's really as we're measuring the risk of your portfolio, which one are we, are we a moderate, are we aggressive, or are we more of a conservative investor? And so that's your longer term horizon, really what you're looking for in a portfolio. Those tactical shifts are something that we're looking at in the next, you know, three, six, 12 month time period uh, to be able to deliver performance, um, whether that's reducing risk and reducing, you know, losses during a, a negative time period or, changing the portfolio so we take a, uh, advantage of, of price appreciation like we did last year. So what changes have we made to our portfolio? Uh, we have reduced uh, equity exposure pretty much across the board in favor of short duration fixed income exposure. Uh, we're starting to see uh, across the, the credit spectrum, across the yield curve, uh, we're, whether it's a longer term or short term, we're starting to see rates in that short term area uh, be economy, be, be uh, compelling. Uh, interest rates there have come up quite a bit. You know, again, when we looked at that chart, interest rates have basically been zero since 2009. Uh, so you haven't been able to go out and get an interest rate from a bank account or a money market or a CD. We're starting to see those rates start to come up across the spectrum, whether it's short duration or long. Uh, within equities, we're reducing U.S. large cap uh, to reduce all overall beta risk. Um, also reducing emerging market equity exposure to benchmark neutral levels, uh, basically because you know, we have strong U appreciation in the U.S. dollar, especially relative to the Chinese yuan. Uh, within fixed income, we've been reducing our intermediate corporate bond ETF in favor of shorter term high yield bonds. And if we went back to the chart um, from our performance over the year, anything in high yield has done fairly well, has held up well this year. Um, and so again, we're becoming inside our fixed income, inside our bonds for short duration um, and higher credit, uh, higher yield in that area. We also added a little bit to our, our ultra short, so the zero to one year short-term bonds. And essentially it's just to mitigate risk during market volatility. So we do have strengthening headwinds to, to global business cycle. And, and I know, again, I know we're gonna be talking about this later in the, the presentation. Uh, whenever you look at the framework for business cycle, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's focus on that late. Um, so early uh, markets taken off, uh, profits grow rapidly. Mid, you start to see things kind of cooling off late. Uh, growth is moderating, credit is tightening. And again, credit is tightening right now because we're seeing those interest rates increasing. Uh, earnings are under pressure, and if you're on any of the earnings calls and, and uh, through our uh, through our macroeconomic uh, firms that we use to, to provide information, we, we watch that on a quarterly basis, but we're starting to see earnings are under pressure for a lot of different companies. Um, policy is con uh, con uh, contradictory, uh, and so that's what we're seeing right now with the, the raising of interest, uh, interest rates and then inventory grow and sales growth stalls. And so that's that's basically where we are. Um, have we tipped over into recession uh, following activity? I think Stuart's gonna go into that a little more in detail here in just a moment. Um, but we are starting to see headwinds in the, the, the business cycle at the moment. Uh, we would say that we're still in, in late expansion, um, but looking, uh, we need to be careful of and, and being very cautious of what that recessionary environment looks like. 
Now I'll turn it over to Stuart to talk about the economy and the macro backdrop. Yeah, thank you, John. Yeah, and just kind of piggyback on what he was saying, he was talking about kind of where we are in the business cycles and really want to spend a couple of time, uh, a couple of minutes just kind of going over what those kind of indicators are and what we're kind of looking at. Uh, because I think one of the first things we, we, we like to do is we like to look at patterns. Um, what's happened in the past, um, try to apply that, what will happen in the present time in the future. Well, that might be difficult um, because every scenario is quite a bit different. There are some things that we can see pretty consistently to help us identify which kind of pattern that we're, we're in. So that will kind of help us set up the portfolios for the present day and be a little more proactive as uh, more uncertainty is certainly ahead of us. So if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see six different indicators. Uh, so I'll just kind of go through them and just kind of identify, is this a late cycle sign or is this a recession sign? So overall growth, if we're in a late cycle, we'll see kind of pace moderates. Um, if it's a recession, activity falls. You know, this is a, a tough one to circle. If I'm going to circle basically the, uh, the, let me get my drawing tool out here. Here, we're kind of right in the middle between these two. So we'll, we'll talk about profit margins declining, um, strong labor markets here in just a second. But right here, we're kind of in between these two cycles. So it's kind of hard to say which one we're in. We're seeing a little bit of both. It's like, was well, it moderation or, or is it actually declining? So this one's a little bit harder. I think we are in kind of a transition mode um, between these two. Um, the next couple are pretty easy to call. Uh, employment, uh, late cycle, we're going to see uh, our job markets begin to tighten and peak. Um, job license begin to rise. We haven't quite even seen this yet. Uh, we definitely haven't seen job losses accelerate. So we're definitely more of on a late cycle um, when it comes to our, our, our labor markets. Credit conditions, same thing. We're on this side. Uh, the curve is beginning to flatten. Uh, of course, we've seen tighten policies. So again, while credit is becoming a concern, liquidity is becoming uh, more of a noisemaker um, here as of lately. Access to credit is still plenty um, as of now. Uh, monetary policy, this is something that you can't get you know, away from. Basically, what is the Fed doing? Um, is it helping? Is it hurting? Uh, basically, uh, John just said it. So we're seeing tightening, which is basically they're slowing down the economy, they're, they're raising rates. Um, and it kind of contradicts itself. So like, why are we doing this when the market's down almost 25% for the year? So that's where that contra uh, uh, kind of contradicts itself. We definitely haven't seen the Fed ease. However, if we go into a deeper recession, we were talking about how much of this downside is already priced in. And we do think, you know, quite a bit of it's priced in because one thing we have to realize about stock markets and the economy is that the market really isn't pricing itself for today. It's pricing itself for basically what we expect one year, three years, even five plus years down the road. So again, we're expecting the markets to slow down. We're expecting earnings to continue to decline. So as long as we don't hear any, any really unexpected bad news, then basically, you know, we should hopefully have a short-lived recession or not very deep recession, but we definitely haven't seen the Fed ease and so, again, if we did go to a deeper recession, we could see the, 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 the Fed reverse its course and begin to lower rates, like John mentioned right at the beginning and the onset of the pandemic. Um, corporate profits becoming under pressure. Profits are declining, yet positive, and then inventories are, are rising. So, again, we are pretty strong late cycle right here. Um, some of the international um, companies uh, or countries, excuse me, like China, um, or are kind of in the recession period a little bit. I'll kind of talk to you about why that's the case here in just a couple minutes. Uh, kind of moving on, I want to talk about some of these indicators, how they've done, what we see and expect kind of going forward. Uh, you know, what this is kind of showing us is the employment conditions are still strong. They still, they're still supporting the, uh, the U.S. consumer. So we're looking at strong labor demand right now. This is keeping unemployment at really all-time lows, and it's keeping ele uh, wages uh, elevated. So on the right-hand side, you'll see basically the U.S. wage growth going back to 1998. So you see the far right-hand side, you see this big spike, and that's really because we see a strong labor market. For every two jobs, two job openings right now, there's only one 
um, unemployed worker. So that's really affecting things. Uh, the pool is down for a couple of reasons. The pandemic has caused a lot of early retirement. Um, a lot of people said, hey, you know, I was considering retirement anyway, but, you know, with all the changes going on, I just don't want to do this anymore. So that's kind of uh, reduced the, the employment pool. And then also what we start looking at this, it's a strong market should prevent a deeper recession. Uh, we do see, see it can't remain this strong um, forever. And we do see job rates probably, um, or the unemployment rate beginning to increase sometime soon. But it is a good sign that um, it should prevent a really, really deep recession. And if we do go into a quote unquote recession, um, hopefully it's not a, it's, it's a more mild one because of our strong labor markets. So, one of the other indicators we talked about was, was corporate growth and corporate earnings. So one thing that we look at is, is basically what are profits of the companies across the S&P? So right here, we're just talking here domestically in the United States, is that we have seen profits remain positive. So that's a good sign. Um, however, they, they're declining um, pretty good so far for the first 10 months of the year. We do see, if you start looking at this uh, Basically, the blue line over here represents the, the the earnings over the past 10 to 11 months. And then the green line will start representing the expectations for, for next year. So we continue, or we, we, we see this trend continue happening throughout 2023 uh, and maybe declining the, the most at the end. So we see a lot of pressures here, of course, um, energy companies, like what sectors, uh, profits, might remain strong. Well, commodity prices, of course, um, are, are really high right now. It's one of the best asset classes we've seen. Um, so energy companies will continue to benefit, but basically all the other sector uh, sectors that are, you know, have a high labor costs, they have um, to deal with higher inflation, higher interest rates, that's definitely going to slow down the economy um, kind of going forward. So again, this definitely puts us into that late cycle uh, mode that we've we've kind of touched on. So again, we, we've seen inflation. We, this is a report that we look at basically, uh, you know, when it comes out, you're going to hear about it from us, from the news. Uh, you know, it topped out at 9.1% 9, 9 earlier in the year. Uh, that was August. That was a 40-year high. We've seen it ease a little bit. Um, we have seen it kind of come down almost a, a percent. So that is, that's, that is good news. Couple reasons why we've, we've seen that uh, kind of come down a little bit is global supply chains um, have kind of eased that they've improved a little bit, um, and over the last couple months we have seen commodity prices kind of come down. So hopefully that allow goods, materials, those types of things, those prices to to stabilize. One thing we we also want to bring up because I've been hearing a lot about it, something that we pay attention to as we put the uh, portfolios together is the strength of the U.S. dollar. Um, you know, over the last 15 years, the U.S. dollar has has just soared, and then we go to 2022, and then it went up another almost 20 percent. So people don't really understand how this helps or hurts the economy, and it's kind of a trick question because a strong dollar can both hurt and help. And so how how it can help as a strong dollar can fight inflation. So that's the that's the good part of of, of a strong dollar. Um, however, a strong dollar can can create a lot of drag on the international trade, international equities. And if you remember what John was talking about, how you saw Germany, especially China, um, probably already in that recession area, and it's because of the strong dollar. Um, it's it's really kind of impacted valuations uh, overseas quite a bit. So, of course, they're going to be hit a little bit more uh, us because they don't really have, uh, you know, everything trades on the U.S. dollar. So 20 percent rise is, is a big hit on, on trade deficits worldwide. So, again, it definitely makes sense that international would be um, hit a little bit first before U.S. So it's, we'll touch on that if that kind of creates opportunity down the road. So inflation Kind of going forward is basically we've seen a big change, um, a big change in driver. What's what's causing inflation? So uh, I quickly mentioned that commodity prices have gone down. So if you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, it was hard to find what you were looking for. Um, global supply chains were were locked up. We had all the barges. Um, you remember a couple of webinars ago, we had that funny picture of just all the barges um, off the coast of California and. 
really you couldn't see. I think it was actually it was last Christmas time, and that was uh, Chris was talking about people going barge to barge Christmas shopping. Um, that's not the case really anymore. Um, it, it's 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 really kind of opened up. So goods of commodities prices, goods have kind of moderated a little bit, but what we've seen is the cost of services increase quite a bit. And uh, the bad news that there is inflation and services can be a little bit more stickier um, and, and kind of keep inflation around for uh, for a little bit longer and harder to, to dramatically decrease. Uh, but we do have a lot of external factors that could hopefully make this a, an outlier that we're dealing with. Of course, uh, we can point to Ukraine, Russia, if a ceasefire ever, you know, kind of uh, happened, that could also speed up a lot of, um, you know, the length of a pending recession or, or this recession. Um, it could definitely basically help inflation um, by basically fixing a couple of different things that are kind of in uh, unbalance inside the market. So we start looking at the Fed, what they're doing. Um, they've raised rates, you know, almost half a dozen times this year. We expect them to continue doing that, continue to slow down, govern this, um, put a governor on the economy to hope curb inflation a little bit. So we, we've seen the, the Fed uh, maybe soften their stance um, as of the last couple of meetings. And so it'll be interesting to see. It looks like they're kind of trying to be a little bit more quiet right before the midterms, but there might be some good reasons to, to say, hey, all right, let's kind of see what the next couple of weeks bring before we right start saying, no, are we going to continue with another you know, 75 bit um, increase or should we lower that or should we just kind of keep status quo for a while? So again, inflation has really moved from goods to services. So it's something definitely to keep, a, a keep an eye on. Kind of bouncing back and forth, just real quick, is if we start looking at international equities and going back to the strong dollar, um, you know, all of the overseas countries are pretty much trading at very, very low valuations or very attractive valuations. Um, of course, international overseas um, markets, emerging markets, developed markets have their risk when it comes to uh, volatility. So it's something that, you know, most of our clients are, you know, getting close to retirement or, or even well into retirement. So it's definitely something we have to keep an eye on. But as we start looking at preserving, you know, losses, uh, both current losses and future losses, we also have to focus on recoveries. Basically, how can we basically grow our portfolios? Uh, because the S&P 500, all the stocks in the U.S. all all won't recover at the same rate. So what are some pockets of opportunity? And because international has gotten the biggest hit because you know of a strong dollar, COVID policies, a lot of the external factors that the U.S. can't control, it could definitely be um, some good pockets of opportunities um, across the, uh, the world. So I already kind of touched this um, unintentionally. It's the, 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 the fiscal policy has shifted a little bit neutral um, ahead of the midterms. There were some whispers that that might be the, the case, that they wanted to kind of um, stay out of the elections midterms, no one pointing the fingers at them. However, I think there is some good reason for them to be neutral right now, uh, you know, with the uh, basically going from 0% to almost 5% in, in, in one single calendar a year is, is basically a record uh, high. So definitely need to let this kind of infiltrate the market, see what it's going to do, um, and definitely keep an eye on the next um, inflation report, which is kind of something that everyone's looking at. I talked about a ceasefire in Ukraine and Russia. One thing that could also really stimulate the market is a very strong inflation report, strong meaning a big reduction. I think that would give a lot of people's confidence and, um, you know, to steal a word earlier, FOMO. So, uh, you know, down 20%, 25%, if we start seeing some good silver linings. We could definitely see um, some positive news because remember, you know, the market being down isn't priced for what's happening now. It's basically what's happening one year two years, three years down the road. So if we think that those years get better because of some good news now, our market's going to change pretty abruptly. So that's how we, when we start putting portfolios together, we don't want to say, hey, what's, you know, what do we think is going to happen and try to predict what's going to happen? Because if we go back to the late cycle to recession, we're like, well, Stuart, if we're in the late cycle and you don't think things are going to get worse, things are going to slow down, and we might have negative profit growth, why wouldn't we go sell and just go to cash? Because kind of what John was saying, I'm saying, a lot of that is already priced in to, to the to the S&P, to the broad or to the broader market. So we 
we don't want to be too cute. We don't want to be too market timing because a lot of that sell-off is already inside the markets. Could go, things go down further? Absolutely, especially if we get worse than expected news. So our outlook kind of going forward, just kind of looking at uh, how the market's recovered after we've seen peak inflation. And so, of course, we've had the 70s and the early 80s that you know, a lot of people will point to refer back to when it comes to fighting inflation and then what, you know, what was it like back then? And so the last or the, the next 12 months after we reached a peak inflation, so inflation started retreating. Most of the time, we've seen some really good returns um, going back to the 70s and 80s. I'm just going to kind of talk about the modern era here quick, which I'll um, we'll point to the 70s and 80s. 31 percent, 33 percent. We've seen. Um, in 1987, 16%, uh, 2008, quite a bit different, a lot of different, uh, that was a whole different uh, animal back then. And then 2011, we saw 28%. So again, the average is about 12% uh, appreciation after we've reached peak inflation. So again, going back to not trying to be market timing, you know, thinking that we're not, we haven't seen the worst. We have seen some really good um, reversals and, and quite quickly as well. So again, that's why we, we've implemented some changes. John, whatever some, some changes we made here recently, I know we've talked about buffered ETFs in the past, and that remains the integral part of our portfolios and, and has actually really helped the portfolios to give us some buying power and flexibility down the road. So that's one thing that our investment team, myself, John, Chris, we're continuously looking at rebalancing the portfolios. Um, continue talking to you and making sure that your portfolios are still matched up with your risk tolerance, your income, and of course, basically your, your objectives. So hopefully that kind of uh, helps clear the air a little bit of things that we're looking at. Uh, and then we have Chris right behind me to uh, kind of wrap things up. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Chris Massenberg, if you don't know, we haven't met. Um, so let's get, kind of get into asset markets, and we've talked a lot about it, so we're going to dive a little bit deeper in uh, some of the topics that we've been going through already. So Stuart, if you could give me the next slide there. So this is what uh, John kind of alluded to, and uh, we were talking about earlier, um, really in this period, uh, this year, uh, there's not really been a good place to hide. So um, Q3 downturn versus year to date, you can see each category there, um, starting with the U.S. equities. Uh, small cap growth, mid cap, large cap value on the top left there. You've got Q3 declines, got year to date uh, declines. You can see all of those are in the negative. Um, really, as we go into this late cycle, possibly recessionary period, depend depending on your definition of it, um, you're going to see equity markets struggle. And that's kind of what we've been talking about throughout this webinar. Um, then you can dive into each category um, and see, well, how, how is each one of those doing? And that graph below the U.S., equity sector, total return, consumer discretionary, down almost 30%. Energy being the one bright spot, uh, up 34.5%. Um, most all of us should be familiar, kind of understand why that one is much higher if we've been to the gas pump lately. Uh, at any point this year, you saw gas prices kind of peak in the summer, start to subside a little bit, but they're still, uh, most places over $3 a gallon uh, here, at least on the Rockwall side. I imagine they're a little bit higher on the Dallas side as well. Financials down 21, industrials, healthcare, utilities, uh, all of that down uh, with the communication services being down almost 39%. So then you look in the middle categories there, and this is what Stuart was just talking about too, with the uh, some of these other countries have been hit a little bit harder. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the dollar and inflation, how all that kind of ties in, but they've gone down a little bit further, and that's why there might be more room for growth on the upside. Um, again, just... A little bit deeper on the decline gives you more room to the upside. So as this thing starts to turn around at some point, those might be the first possible things to, to go and the quickest on the rise. Um, so then you look at the total U.S. factors and in, in, in the bottom, that's going to be momentum, size of companies, low volatility, quality, value, and yield. Okay, so that's that's what we're looking at. Also, when you look at different categories, momentum is, you know, just like it sounds, what has the momentum going forward? Sometimes that can be you know, things like technology and innovation, those real cyclical categories, or sometimes it can be defensive. So we're really just kind of cheap, keeping an eye on the overall momentum of each category, where it's headed, where we think it's going to be in the future, because it's not just a now, it's a six months, nine months, 12 months, 
one year, three years, as Stuart said, market's always forward looking. So we want to keep an eye on each category. Um, and that's what we're doing with, along with the investment team. Um, and then fixed income, total returns. We talked a little bit about that again, just real, real brief. No, no place real, really high in those categories. Um, high yield down 14. You've got treasuries down 13. So as interest rates go up, the value of bonds have declined throughout the year. Um, and as interest rates continue to rise, you might see that same trend. Um, the hope and the thought is that we might see some of the uh, yields start to subside and level off going forward uh, as they start to turn from the word that everybody likes to use is pivot. As the Fed pivots from that hawkish to a more dovish stance um, in the future, you'll see those numbers start to look better. So you can go ahead and go to the next one for me, Stuart. So what we're looking at here is uh, what high inflation implies for a maturing business cycle. So we talked a lot about the business cycle, um, what really indicates those categories. So you got early, mid, late, and recessionary cycles. And then how does that compare or match up to your real, real returns in a low inflationary environment here on the left versus a high inflationary environment on your right? So if you look on the left, um, the blue, you've got U.S. equities. The green is going to be labeled as commodities. And then the darker blue is going to be your investment grade bonds. And then over on the left-hand side, the percentages is your annualized average real return. And then at the bottom, it's going to be indicated by the, the, the point in which the cycle was. All of this is going to be obviously past uh, data from 1950 to 2020. So in the early cycle, you can see U.S. equities really had a high annualized rate of return. That means, you know, basically when things are good, times are recovering from those bottoms, that's when you're going to see the greatest average return on those U.S. equities. Then you get into this mid-cycle and you see still double-digit return for U.S. equities, which is great uh, because we're getting into this boom phase of the, uh, of the business cycle. So recovery is where things start to really take off. Everyone's excited. There's exuberance. The mid, everyone's still excited. Things are still going well. And then you get into this later cycle, which is that third one, and things start to really level off, right? U.S. equities can be flat to a negative. Um, and then traditionally, commodities are going to be a little bit higher than uh, than they were uh, than the U.S. equities are going to be because um, things typically like gold and energy that's kind of uh, inflation proof if you will a lot of that stuff keeps up with inflation or doesn't really have a high impact from that and then your investment grade bonds are typically going to outperform your equities in a late cycle uh, one caveat being obviously if rates are increasing then your uh, investment grade bonds might not keep up with that so you go into that final category of recession. That's where you see U.S. equities decline, commodities decline as well. And then again, investment grade bonds historically have been able to offset a lot of that U.S. equity decline. But we're in a unique situation where interest rates are going up as well as equities going down. So then you look at a real return in a high inflationary environment. Again, in the early cycle, U.S. equities outperform. Mid to late cycle, they're going to they're going to be slightly above average. Uh, where your commodities in a late cycle are really going to outperform. And that's kind of what we've seen this year in that late cycle graph is commodities tend to outperform, uh, again, with the biggest outperformer being energy. And then this recessionary period, this is where you see uh, U.S. equities really, on average, have that steepest decline and commodities investment grade kind of offset some of that risk uh, historically. At least that's the way it's played out up until 2020. Uh, this is the reason we show you this or the reason that, that I'm, we're going through that part is to just really show you that those U.S. equities can have a big decline. But if you go from that recessionary period and you were to take that loop back around to the early cycle. So if we get through this recessionary piece on the on the very far right and we go back back around to the rebound in the early, that's where you're going to see that biggest rebound of U.S. equity. So it's it's not necessarily Stuart alluded to. It's, it's not necessarily a time to abandon chip and go to cash. You want to look for opportunities where we get out of the recessionary period and we can have that swing on the upside. Do you want to go ahead and go to the next one for me, Stu? So talked about the, the dollar and the impact it has. So here, here's a comparison to a 10-year real yield return, basically, for the U.S. versus um, your developed market economies. So the U.S. is going to be illustrated in the blue graph there, the blue line. And then the developed markets is going to be on the green side. And you can see... We've had a huge run up in yields much quicker than a lot of the developed markets. And it's because 
of that Fed raising rates and yields going up with it. So that's why you're going to see a lot higher, uh, at least now and starting in 2020, I'm sorry, 2022, when the Fed started raising those rates, that's when you saw that real yield go up. As you know, uh, that's offset a lot by inflation. So then we look at the FX valuation, the graph on the right. So purchasing power is something that Stuart talked about a lot. So the last 12 month range is represented by that blue graph. Uh, in the different currencies at the bottom, you'll see the GBT. So it's a British pound, uh, the Japanese yield, the Canadian dollar, and the euro as well. So a lot of these are at the low end of that blue graph on the last 12 month range because they've been basically going down. As the US dollar gets stronger, these get more and more undervalued because as Stuart was talking about, and I believe John mentioned, purchasing power worldwide is kind of pegged to the US dollar. So as the dollar gets stronger, it's good because we can buy more things internationally, but it's bad for international trade because other countries, their money or their currency is not valued as high or worth as much purchasing power through the US dollar. So it hurts a lot of people as well as helps some, uh, but the offset as you can see is the undervalue on all the other currencies. So the next one we'll talk about a little bit again, business cycle and approach to the equity sector. sector. So you can see different business cycles, the early, mid, late, and recessionary ones. And what this, what this graph is really illustrating is the different categories. And the one plus is gonna be kind of mixed data, but on the positive side, a green box with two pluses means that historically all of the metrics line up and it should be good for that particular uh, sector. So if you could see where Stuart's highlighting there, the consumer staple sector in this late to recessionary period typically outperforms. And so do utilities and energy. You can see right there in the middle has that double positive because typically in this late cycle period, that's going to outperform because defensive and inflation resistant sectors tend to perform better uh, during more cyclical uh, sectors underperformed during that period. So going forward, energy might turn the other way, as the question mark indicates there. And consumer staples, healthcare, utilities are something that or we might lean on more and more going into this recessionary period as we try to get inflation under control. So let's go ahead and go through the long-term themes. Um, so we talked to he talked a little, Stuart mentioned uh, Ukraine and Russia and some of the stuff that's going on there. And so if you look at the first graphs, the, the 1990s through the early, uh, let's call it the early 21st century, um, pretty stable period. Um, really just as far as, global powers and, and uh, the geopolitical risk with those powers. Um, as it says here, the respect for neighbor's sovereignty. Um, it was really just the US in that category. So things were really very stable. Um, the 1960s through the 1980s, some of you might remember, uh, we had this Cold War era um, after Vietnam, after World War II, uh, the USSR, the Soviet Union and the US went into this Cold War area where it was an arms race um, and really there was a big standoff for all of that. So that was a not so very stable, but still overall pretty stable compared to, if you fast forward to today, where it seems to be very unstable compared to the past, uh, where you have the US, the EU, China, Russia, all jockeying for position. Uh, obviously Russia being a big problem right now with their invasion of the Ukraine. Um, and it kind of leaves the EU and the US in a place where we don't know uh, really where to step in, in my mind, and how much to help or how little to help um, so that we don't trigger another worldwide event where countries are fighting, again, in some, some fashion like a world war. So um, it's a very unstable for the geopolitical risk. But the good news is that, you know, Stuart mentioned, if there's some sort of agreement had, the market overall is starving for good news because there's so much bad news priced in. Geopolitical, inflation, all of it. If we were to see something stabilize in this area, I think that the market would react in such a positive manner that uh, it might look like a slingshot towards the upside. So uh, just to give you an idea of what's causing a lot of the uncertainty in the geopolitical realm, that's, that's what's doing it. So let's look at the next one. As far as GDP goes, um, really global, glo global growth um, is kind of the expectation going forward. So the last 20 years, right in the middle, you can see the the global or real GDP growth for the last 20 years globally, 2.7% average. The consensus for the next 20 years looks more like 2%. So you'll see the, the green bar, the green bar countries are going to be the developed markets, the blue or the emerging markets. And then that green diamond is going to be the last 20 years 
uh, of GDP and kind of where those countries landed. So the expectation is that the emerging markets are going to lead going forward in that GDP growth, and some of the more stable developed markets are going to be kind of like they've been in the past. You know, that you see the U.S. is right on where we, the projection for the U.S. right in the middle is right on where it was the last 20 years. So slow and steady as she goes, very predictable because we, we want a certain outcome and that's the outcome that we hope to get. And it's the outcome that we've seen in the past. So, so that's kind of the consensus going forward there. We think the emerging markets will out, outpace the rest of us. Um, so real returns in a diversified portfolio versus starting in cash during inflationary periods. Um, and you can see the the first the, the left side is going to be the cash portion when inflation is under 4% in the annualized return. And then the next piece is the balanced portfolio over a three, five-year, 10-year time period uh, when inflation is under 4%. So and you see the annualized returns there. It's basically 65 to 7% in most cases. Uh, when you've got inflation over 4%, you can see... Um, the balanced portfolio is not, not nearly as high on the return side, um, obviously having to keep up with inflation, but overall you can still see the best way historically to keep up with inflation has been equities or in a balanced model. Um, that's been the best way to keep up with inflation better than, than any cash. So um, I think the highest I've seen as far as savings and CD rates recently um, is still right around 1%. So I, I'm still not getting too excited about the cash buckets. Um, there are some annuity, fixed annuities out there um, that are paying four, four and a half percent for a fixed term, like three year, five years. So there are some things out there you can get some of them, but you're still losing to that 8% inflation. So um, so this next one, this S&P performance during election cycle. So I know this is all on our mind with election day. Here it is, we're, we're in it, this midterms. So, um, but we wanna talk also real quick about the presidential cycle, because this is, this is a, Something, I, if you've worked with me in the past, you've heard me mention this. Um, there are certain indicators historically on how the market typically does during a president's term. So you can see the first one during the election year, um, those, 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 those profits can be six and 9%, uh, depending on which side the president is on. Uh, and then the first year of the presidential term, typically still a good year, midterm and election years, um, year two of a presidential term, it's kind of a mixed bag. It's pretty close, 5.8, 6.2. Uh, but historically speaking, the third year of any presidential term is usually the best year. Um, that's when they get kind of the most done in most cases. Uh, and that's historically the best time for the markets because then they know uh, who's in office, what parties are in Congress, and they're not going to be running uh, campaigns for a whole nother year. So this is typically the third year we're going into in 2023. It's typically the best year for the market overall, historically speaking. And then um, also going back to 1932, uh, here's what we're dealing with right now with the midterms. So uh, when you have midterm cycles, um, really this, this far right is kind of what we're in right now because we've got the Democratic president and most polls according, well, most likely outcome according to the polls, um, and we all know how accurate polls are, right? So according to the polls, the Democratic president with a split Congress, on average, historically since 1932, has returned on average a 14% return in the following year. So the outcome, if we have a Democratic president and a fully Republican Congress, it's about a 13% on average the following year. So this is kind of what the expectation is going forward is we might see something like one of these two. Um, again, that's really just historical data. I think really what's gonna kind of also really heavily weigh on these numbers is gonna be uh, obviously inflation if we can curb that. Uh, it's gonna take some time for all the Fed rate hikes that they've done to kind of get back into the market. So if you remember uh, this time last year, um, the, the buzzword uh, that everyone was using was transitory. Inflation was transitory. Um, so we know that all the stuff we did in 2020 and 2021 with the, uh, all of the money that we printed and put into the system, we know that that didn't really catch up in the data until December or so of 2021. So that's when we saw inflation really peak and supply chains, supply chains getting in a lot of trouble. And that's where we saw all of that data. So it, we didn't start raising rates until May, April, May of this year, and that's or maybe even March, and that's where we're going to see 
it takes a little lag. It takes time for those rate hikes to hit the data. So we're really anticipating the CPI number later this week, hoping that starts to subside. I think even moderate slightly is a good news. And I think the market will react positively because if we start going in a downward tra uh, trajectory with that inflation number, I think that's going to be good for all of us. So let's go ahead and look at the last one here. So really, um, what's it, what's most important? And, and we've got the periodic table of returns here to show you going back to 2003, each category and why we stay diversified in all markets. Uh, no matter what period of time we're in, it's, it's best to stay diversified. So you can look at a couple of different categories, but you can see year to date where everything is. Uh, commodities leading the way at 14% increase. Investment grade bonds down 15%, high yield down 15, value stocks down 18. Most 60 40, port, traditional 60 40 portfolios, 60% um, large cap and 40% investment grade bonds down 20% year to date as of September 30th. So, as Stuart talked about, a lot of the portfolios that we, we built for you guys, as far as how that's structured, those buffered ETFs to prevent or help protect some of the downside. And then any, any annuity positions are obviously principal protected. So, th this is why we structure accounts this way for years just like this. And this is why we have options when we start to see the things uh, subside as far as inflation or geopolitical risk. We can take money out of principal protected or low risk buckets and start to get back into more growth buckets. Really, it's just a matter of sometimes protecting more of the downside than it is trying to capture upside. So with that, I, I hope all you guys enjoyed everything that we had to say here. And if you have any questions, we'll be, uh, we'll be around and available. And I look forward to talking with each and every one of you uh, when the opportunity presents itself. And uh, thank you for joining us today.